Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video we have my Double Game Week 25 preview. Of course we'll have a specific focus on the upcoming Double Game Week, but also planning ahead around chip strategies and blank and double players for the future as well. If you are enjoying the content here on this channel and you get any use out of today's video, please do smash that like button. And if you're new around here, make sure to subscribe as well. But without further ado, let's jump into it. So I thought it would be useful to start the video by discussing the best defenders in FPL from game week 25 to 29, especially given the fact that Trent is currently yellow flagged and there are predictions that he might not be available for the double game week. But even if Trent is suddenly available, I think there are some people that are looking at defensive transfers at the moment, either this week or going into the blank game week. So I think it is worth discussing who we have as options. There will be caveats non-stop in this video because it is cliche to say, but very true. It's very team dependent at the moment. It depends on which players you currently own, how much money you have in the bank, what your chip strategy is, which game which you plan on attacking and much, much more. So I can't give you the best advice for your team. All I can do is discuss the different permutations and players and you come to the best decision for your team. Just to remind you what we've got coming up. We have the double game week, obviously this week for Luton, Liverpool, Man City and Brentford. We then have a blank game week next week in game week 26 for Chelsea, Spurs, Liverpool and Luton. And then after that, the next thing we have is obviously game week 28, which is the double for Bournemouth and Luton. And then we have game week 29, which is the big blank game week. So two double game weeks, then the blank in 26, but then 29 is the thing that a lot of people are starting to think about. The teams that we know for certain play in game week 29, the blank game week, are Villa, West Ham, Brentford, Burnley, Fulham, and Spurs. They are the only six teams, those three fixtures, that we currently have definitely going ahead in 29. I will discuss teams that are more likely to play in 29 than others throughout this, but those are the only six teams that we know for sure. And as you can see in the graphic directly above my head, the only teams that definitely play in both blank game week 26 and blank game week 29 are Villa, West Ham, Brentford, Burnley, and Fulham. Spurs obviously blank in 26, and therefore they are the only team that are currently definitely playing in 29 that will not serve you well for 26. The most important thing that I'd like to say before I get into discussing these defenders is if you know for certain you are free hitting in 26 or you are free hitting in 29, it will massively change which defenders and players that you look at in general. For example, if you know you're free hitting in 26 for certain, I would look at you Doggy or Pedro Porro this week for a defender because Spurs have absolutely excellent fixtures outside of the blank in 26 and they've got Fulham in game at 29 confirmed. And you, Doggy and Pedro Porro have some attacking threat. The reason I'm not going to discuss them here is I think for most people, they're probably not looking at free hitting in 26 and that would create an issue for them. Equally, when I go through here and say this player plays in 29, if you're going to free hit in 29, then that just really doesn't matter to you. Target the fixtures outside of that. So with all of those caveats and extra information out the way, here are some of the defenders that I would be looking at at the moment, whether that be for a Trent replacement or just defenders in general. In this table, we have price for each defender. We have minutes per game this season. We've got their non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90, which gives us a bit of an idea about their attacking threat for the season again. And then what I've got for their team defensive data is I've got their team defensive data across the season. So for Van Heck, the first player here, Brighton are the 10th best defense in the league this season for a non-penalty expected goals conceded. And then I've got their defensive data across the last six. And in this case, Brighton are also 10th across the last six for non-penalty expected goals conceded. The reason for that is I think it's important to look at our teams trending in the right direction or the wrong direction. But do bear in mind that across the last six, some teams might have had very easy fixtures and some teams might have had more difficult fixtures. The only final thing on this table before I look at the actual defenders, five minutes after saying I was going to look at defenders, is game week 26 and game week 29. If it is green, it means they definitely play there. So you can see, for example, for Aston Villa and for Brentford, they definitely play in both 26 and 29. If it is red, it means that team definitely blanks there. If it is orange, it means they are very likely to blank. And if it is yellow, it means they are kind of maybe possibly going to play and possibly not going to play. So I'll discuss that as we go through each team, but hopefully that table is clear to you. So starting with Van Heck, I really like Van Heck because he's, by the way, if you see me looking this way, I'm looking at the official fantasy site. Van Heck's fixtures coming up are really, really nice other than the fact that he is very likely to blank in 29. So if you don't need him in 29, Sheffield United this week, Everton at home in the blank, Fulham away, 
Forest at home. But then after that, 29 onwards, the fixtures do start to turn for the worst. And again, he's almost definitely, I would say, the most likely team along with Manchester City to blank in game week 29. So if you need players for there and you don't want a free hit in that week, Van Heck is not the one to go for. But if you don't need him in 29 and you just need a cheap defender for the meantime, especially to cover you in blank game week 26, he's very, very nailed. No, he doesn't have that much attacking data. And no, Brighton aren't the perfect defense. But I do think he's an excellent option nonetheless. Another cheap option that I really like is Branthwaite at 4.2 million. Obviously, absolutely nailed on. Brilliant performances this season. And I couldn't believe this. For non-penalty expected goals conceded, Everton are the fourth best defence in the league this season. They have been remarkably good. Across the last six, slightly weaker, they are ninth for non-penalty expected goals conceded. But still, a really decent defence. The fixtures for Branthwaite, if we just take a look at them now, Palace and Brighton in the next two. I like it. So again, if you need someone for this week and then for the double, I don't mind it. I don't think it's the best fixture for the double, um, for the blank, I should say, in 26 against Brighton away. But it's certainly not a difficult fixture. Then West Ham in 27. The issue with Branthwaite, as with Van Heck, very, very likely to blank in 29 because he's got Liverpool. And of course, as long as Liverpool progress in the fifth round of the FA Cup, which we very much expect them to do into the next round, then Branthwaite will blank. So I think Branthwaite and Van Heck are very unlikely to play in 29. So once again, if you don't need a person for 29, Van Heck and Branthwaite are great. But if you do, I wouldn't be going for the two of them. Moving then on to Senesi, I think a really interesting option because he's actually got exceptionally strong goal threat. 0.17 expected goals per 90, expected goal involvement per 90, I should say, is actually the third best on this list. So there is a lot to like about him for that reason. And as you can see across the season, Bournemouth, uh, Bournemouth are ninth for defensive data. And in the last six, they are the fourth best defense in the league. Really, 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 really nice option. The other reason that I really like Senesi is he has that brilliant double that we spoke about, Sheffield United and Luton at home in game week 28. My issue with him is he plays against Newcastle this week, which I don't think is great from a defensive perspective. And then in the blank game week that you really need him, he's got Manchester City. So I kind of feel like if you're planning to free hit in 26, he is a really nice option. He actually has a slightly greater chance of playing in blank game week 29 as well. So there is a lot to like about him. I just think with the immediate fixtures not being great and with there being no confirmation he plays in 29, he's not for me. But if your chip strategy or structure of your team means that you just really need him for that double and you can bench him in some of the upcoming game weeks, then, then maybe he is the option for you. Obviously, Alfie Doughty was very popular last week and rightly so, right? He played against Sheffield United at home. It was a great fixture and he doubles this week. And it is always nice to get a doubler. We know that he has got, again, the best day try in out of all of these defenders here. His data isn't as good as some people make out. It's only 0.21 non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90. He creates a lot of chances, but they tend to be quite, quite low XG chances. So Alfie Doughty is certainly not like a game breaker, but very, very good for that price. My issue with Alfie Doughty is a couple of things. One, Luton are the worst defense in the league this season, bar none. They are 12th over the last six. They've certainly shown some signs of improvement, but they are not a good defense. The other thing is they definitely blank in 26 and the double this week isn't great. So you're not expecting a clean sheet this week. You need an attacking return. He blanks in 26 and he doesn't even have a confirmed fixture in 29. Lots of people seem to think that Luton are definitely playing in 29. They would need Forrest to lose to Manchester United and Luton to lose to City in the FA Cup fifth round for that to be the case. And I think there is a small to decent chance that Forrest actually beat Manchester United, in which case Luton would blank. So whilst I do really like Doughty, and again, he obviously has that double in 28, as do Bournemouth. But for me, I'm looking at having issues with my team in 26, and therefore I, he's probably not a player I'll look at until at least game week 28. Now we start to move on to players that if you aren't planning to free hit or wildcard before the, the game week starting with the number three, so anything from game week 30 onwards, if you're trying to save your chips over the next four to five game weeks, Aston Villa and Brentford defenders will serve you very well because they play in 26 and they play in 29. But the great thing about Aston Villa and Brentford defenders is they also have good fixtures in those two. So if we look at Paul Torres, he's got Nottingham Forest at home and then West Ham in game week 29. And for Brentford, they've got West Ham in 26, but then Burnley in 29. So they will cover you really nicely for the blanks. My issues firstly starting with Aston Villa is that Paul Torres still hasn't started a game since coming back from his injury. And he's actually had absolutely no minutes as well, apart from the one time where he actually aggravated his injury. So with Pau, we don't even know how close he is to getting a start ahead of Clement Longley, but we think it will be sooner rather than later. 
Cater. You could go for another Aston Villa defender, but Contra is out injured. Cash, we don't know how fully nailed he is because they could play a number of other options or try and switch around the sort of formation and structure that they have of the team. And we know that Cash's performances have been inconsistent. You could go for Diego Carlos as well, potentially as an option, but I don't think he is 100% nailed, especially if Contra is back sooner rather than later. And then on the left-hand side, I know Moreno has been playing quite a lot, but Luca Dean has been injured. And I think now that he's back, there will be a bit more rotation. So I think Power Torres is the only fully nailed one, but only once he is fit enough to go back into the starting 11. My other issue with Aston Villa is Bubakar Kamara is now out for the season. And I think he is arguably the most important element of the Aston Villa defense. I know he doesn't play in defense, but he protects the back four incredibly well. And he's the one that often drops into defense when one of the attacking fullbacks, especially if it's Matty Cash, bombs on. So I just kind of think that the Aston Villa defense is probably going to trend in the wrong direction now, but beggars can't be choosers and we don't have a, a, a massive amount of great options that play in both 26 and 29. So I think you could definitely do worse than Pau Torres. My issue with Brentford is, uh, yes, they double this week, but it's a terrible double. And yes, they have good fixtures in 26 and 29. But outside of that, the fixtures are horrific. So if we look over here, they've got Obviously, Liverpool and City this week. West Ham away is an okay fixture. I don't mind that. But then it's Chelsea and Arsenal. They then serve you well for Burnley in 29. But then they've got Manchester United, Brighton, Villa. They're not good fixtures outside of 26 and 29. So if you need this player to play more regularly for you, it's probably not going to go particularly well. The other thing around Brentford is they are not defending well. As you can see here, across the last six, they are the 17th best defense in the league. So they are a team that is trending in the wrong direction. So I don't mind Brentford and Villa, but they don't come without their issues. For me, if you're looking at the most sensible replacement this week, if you're looking to replace Trent or just replace any of your other defenders, and you know that you're not going to free hit in 26 or 29, it probably is Pau Torres, Regulon, or Pinnock. For me, I like Regulon the most if we're going off goal threat and assist threat because he's on a lot of set pieces, pretty much all of the corners for Brentford at the moment, and he takes the odd free kick as well. And from open play, if they continue to play with this back five formation, I think he'll get a lot of chances to create goals. So I think I would go for Pinnock out of the three, sorry, Regulon out of the three, just about. If we're not looking to bring in Aston Villa or Brentford defenders, I've actually got Maguire and Dallow on this list. And I know Manchester United, probably not a defense you want to look at. They are the 15th best defense in the league this season. So they have not been defending well. However, they obviously have a really decent fixture this week against Luton. In the blank game at 26, they then play against Fulham at home. And they also have a chance of playing, as I said, in blank game week 29. If Manchester United lose to Nottingham Forest in the fifth round of the FA Cup, which could definitely happen. And by the way, we'll find that out between game week 26 and 27. So going into game week 27, we'll know which team's blank in 29. They play against Sheffield United at home in blank game week 29, if that fixture goes ahead. So I kind of feel like you are taking a gamble here because they may not play in 29. But given the fixtures over the next two game weeks, given the fact that they'll cover you really nicely in blank game week 26, and given that they could well have a fixture against Sheffield United in 28, in 29, I should say, it's a decent bet to take. So I am leaning more and more, believe it or not, towards bringing in a Manchester United defender, knowing full well, by the way, that they are not going to be fantastic for clean sheets. But are any of these teams, like I said, Villa have been good this season, but they've lost Konza and Kamara. That's massive. Brentford are not a particularly good defence. And the fixtures outside that are absolutely awful. So no, Manchester United aren't great, but maybe the best of a bad bunch. So I am looking at Maguire and Dallow. If you are wondering who is more nailed on, I think they're both as nailed as each other at the moment. Dallow has played pretty much every minute available for us this season. And Maguire, I think in the absence of Lissandro Martinez, he has to play. And since coming back into the starting 11, he's been brilliant once again. So I think both of these players will play pretty much every available minute. So I like the pair of them. Moving on to just, I've just used one example here of a Newcastle defender, which is Fabian Scher. I don't mind the idea of bringing in a Newcastle defender, but they are the worst defense in the league at the moment. And they're actually the third worst team in the league defensively across the season. So like they're a bad defense. And I think it's about time we just realize they are not a good defense. The other issue that I have with Newcastle is again, they are very likely to blank in game at 29 and in blank game at 26, they play against Arsenal. So for me, you could definitely do better than a Newcastle defender. He does have a bit of goal threat, Fabian Scher, but I just would be steering clear of the Newcastle defense for me. There will be a lot of discussion around Man City defenders, right? Ake and Walker, they both started in the UCL against Copenhagen. They've both been the two most nailed City defenders probably this season, especially Ake recently has played pretty much every minute available for Man City. And they've both actually got decent underlying numbers. 
Walker's got a bit of creative threat with his assist, the odd cross he puts in, and obviously those sideways passes to some very good players. And Ake has some decent goal threat from set pieces. So you do have a little bit of attacking threat with these City defenders. And as you can see here, across the last six, they are the second best defense in the league. And across the season, they are the second best defense in the league. So City defenders are brilliant if they play. My concern with City is, yes, they've got a double this week, which is great. And yes, they play in game at 26, but they only play in 26 if they play, if that makes sense, right? It's not just they have a fixture. You also need that defender to start. And am I confident that any City defender starts the next three games? I'm just not. I'm really not. And especially given that Ake and Walker have played, obviously, against Copenhagen as well, that, I would say, reduces their chances slightly of playing every minute available across the next three as well. With Ake, Gvardiol can play there. I know he wasn't in the squad against Copenhagen, but he can play on the left. You can have Akanji playing on the left as well. You can have Diaz playing at left centre back. Akanji can switch across the left centre back as well. So Ake's got some threat. And with Walker, you could play Rico Lewis in that role, or you can play Stones or Akanji if they want to invert instead. So for me, neither Ake nor Walker are completely nailed, and it, it makes it slightly more difficult to select a City defender because, yeah, it feels like they've got an extra fixture, but they don't necessarily. Outside of that, obviously, like I said, City are very likely to blank in 29 as well, so it creates a future headache for you too. So given that I will definitely need my players to play in 26, and if I'm bringing them in for a double, I also want them to play for both in the double, I'm probably not considering a Man City defender, sadly, despite the fact that, again, they're a great defense and they've got some attacking threat. If you are to bring in a City defender, I genuinely do think it is probably Ake at the moment, but I wouldn't expect him to start the next three. I'd expect him to start two. And I guess in an ideal world, you probably want to see him start Brentford at home and then Bournemouth away in game week 26. You don't want him to start Brentford and Chelsea and then get benched against Bournemouth. So it's very difficult, in my opinion, to select a City defender. So for me, I wouldn't be doing it. You've then got Saliba, just briefly to discuss Arsenal defenders. This could be Gabriel as well if you don't currently own him. It is still potentially worth bringing in an Arsenal defender because they are the best defense in the league this season. They're the best defense over the last six. They have been the best defense regardless of what sample size you look at. And the fixtures are actually really good. Apart from actually game week 26, it's not great against Newcastle. Outside of that, they've got really good fixtures. They play against Burnley, Sheffield United and Brentford across the next four game weeks, three of them. So yeah, I would still be tempted to bring in an Arsenal defender. And again, this fixture this week is, is really, really good. The other thing to note about Arsenal, you're going to start to not see the full graphic because my arm's in the way. They've actually got a chance of playing in 29 as well. If Chelsea lose to Leeds in the fifth round of the FA Cup, Arsenal and Chelsea will have a fixture in game week 29. So yes, I actually still really like the Arsenal defence. If you don't own one, I would definitely be looking to bring one in. If you've already got one of them, would I go for a double up ahead of maybe some of the other assets? Maybe I'm less convinced, but I certainly think there is something to be said for just bringing in a defender from the best defence in the league. The final player to discuss, and I guess the final team to discuss, is Liverpool. I will just go straight out there and say, if you're free hitting in 26 or you don't have many players that blank in 26... I would just, yeah, I'd probably bring in Van Dyke if, you, if you're going to replace Trent this week because it's such a brilliant double. And then in game week 27, they play against Forest as well. So if you don't need them in 26, I really don't mind it. My, I suppose my issue is if you do need them in 26, you're bringing in Van Dyke, yes, for a really nice double, but then you're taking him straight back out. So it's two transfers for one week and he would need to go very big. You'd need at least two clean sheets and then maybe even an attacking return to make that feel like it's worth it. Ahead of just bringing in someone in like a Regalon or even a Dallo or a Pau Torres that play in 25 and 26 and then maybe even have a potential fixture in 29 as well. So I, I think the only time I'd be looking to bring Van Dijk in is if you're free hitting in 26, don't have that many issues or you're just very happy to take a massive hit and remove him once again. There will obviously be questions around Robertson and Bradley and Canate. I think Canate will start both in the double, but probably not worth it for me given that Van Dijk, I think, has superior attacking threat. And there is some doubts. You could obviously see someone like a Joe Gomez playing at centre-back. On Bradley, I do expect Bradley to start one at least again if Trent is out. But Gomez, once again, can play at right-back. They could even see a situation where they play at like Simicast and Robertson, I suppose. But more likely than not, it will be Bradley start one. And I would imagine Joe Gomez could start one too. And I guess the only reason you'd want to bring in Bradley is if you're 100% sure that Trent is out of both games. So for me, the only... Uh, the only Liverpool defender I'll be looking at is Van Dijk. I have spent so long there talking about defenders, far longer than I wanted to, but I think it's an important discussion to have this week. For me, I've already got Pau Torres, so I'm ruling him out. But if we get like confirmation he's going to start, or Emmy's really keen on him, I think he's a fine transfer for your team. So for me, it's either going to be banking on the fact that Trent plays if we don't have full information, or it will be a Brentford or Manchester United defender. 
So my two most likely replacements at the moment are Regulon and Dallow. Believe it or not. I didn't think I'd ever be saying that, but that's the situation we're in. Let me know down below if you're bringing in a defender this week, who are you looking at? So there were also lots of questions around triple captaincy and bench boost this week with lots of people looking at either using the triple captain or bench boost. So I think it is worth discussing which one I would play if either. And even if you have fully decided which chip you're likely to play, these sections should still be useful because I'm talking about possible future usage, of course, with a chip that you decide not to use. So as I said, lots of people looking at triple captain this week, and it's understandable. Erling Haaland is probably, if not definitely, the best asset in FPL for us alongside Mohamed Salah. He's now fully fit, looking pretty good, and City seem to be firing on all cylinders. And he's got two home fixtures against two defences that have been struggling a little bit recently in Chelsea and Brentford. So on paper, yes, this is a fantastic time for the triple captaincy. But of course, other people looking at maybe playing their bench boost or potentially looking at a possible future opportunity to play the triple captain with maybe slightly better fixtures or just with a differential option. Because lots of people will look at it and say, everyone's got Haaland. Everyone's going to captain him, and most people are triple captaining him. Even if he scores 40 points, I'm probably not gaining much. And to be honest, that is very valid. You probably aren't. But I would say the flip side is, if you only captain him, you're probably losing rank every time he does something because so many people will own captain and triple captain. And I know that is difficult to wrap your head around, but it is very likely if you only captain Haaland this week, you definitely won't gain much, but you may even lose points. So I wouldn't not triple captain Haaland purely based on ownership. That is an important thing for me to say here. You are trying to get the most possible points from your triple captain. It doesn't matter if that triple captain is 1% or 100% owned. It is just who gets you the most points with that chip. So if you think Haaland is the best triple captain, absolutely play it on him. But what I wanted to look at is what are the other potential opportunities that we have to use the triple captain later on in the season if you haven't used it yet and maybe you're not completely sure on using it in game week 25. The first and most notable one, and we know for a fact this double is going ahead, is Solanke in game week 28. So in game week 28, we have a confirmed double for Bournemouth of Sheffield United at home and Luton at home. So this looks like an absolutely fantastic opportunity for Solanke. I would argue two of the best fixtures, if not the best two, maybe you could say Burnley at home slightly better, but Solanke has everything you want from a captain. Plays 90 minutes, good underlying data, and he has the two fixtures as well. You are guaranteeing 180 minutes of Solanke at home on pens. My only slight concern is Bournemouth have dropped off slightly recently. And also Solanke is just no, nowhere near the asset of someone like a Haaland or a Salah. He is a very, very, very good asset. And I would love to have him in my team. ASAP and I will definitely own and captain him for 28. But Solanke with slightly better fixtures, maybe even with slightly better minutes, that may still not be a better option for me than Haaland. So I'm less keen on this, purely just down to Solanke versus Haaland. And I would always back Haaland or even a Salah in that situation. But I do really like it. The other thing that I like about Game Week 28 is on paper, you shouldn't need or want to play another chip in that week. In 25, you could play the free hit. You could play the bench boost, as we'll discuss in the next section. And in 34 and 37, the other two doubles coming up, which we'll discuss in a second, again, you could play the free hit. You could play the bench boost in those weeks, whereas 28 is kind of a standalone, very small double game week where it's very unlikely you want to play another chip other than triple captain. So I like it there that you don't have to change your chip strategy with other chips. You just get Solanke in and triple captain him. So it is very nice and you will gain quite a lot there because I don't think that many people, I think there'll be a few, but I don't think that many people will be looking to triple captain Solanke. So that's the most known opportunity coming up. We're then looking ahead to fixtures that we don't yet currently know. So we can confirm to you that there will be a small double game week in game week 34 and the remaining largest double game week of the season will be game week 37. I can confirm that to you. But regarding which teams will double exactly and which fixtures will go in 34 or 37, we don't yet know. Predominantly, the fixtures that are going into 34 and 37 are the fixtures that are not going ahead in game week 29. So we know we have a blank game week in 29 and the likes of Liverpool and City will probably not be playing in 29. And those fixtures will create double game weeks in 34 and 37. Based on the projected fixtures from James over at Planet FPR, and please do, do go check out their podcast. They do fantastic work, and James is really good at predicting upcoming blanks and doubles. He has projected that these will be the fixtures in Game Week 37 for Liverpool and City, but he has obviously provided the caveat that he can't predict accurately, and anything could happen which could change this around. But we would be looking at potentially in Game Week 37 having a double Game Week for Salah of Aston Villa away and Fulham away, and potentially a double Game Week for Haaland of Fulham away and Tottenham away. So decent fixtures on paper. They aren't overly difficult double game weeks, especially Salah, you would maybe say slightly easier unless Villa start to turn it on again defensively. I've got a few issues with this though. 
uh, let's say three issues. The first issue being they are both away for both Salah and Haaland. And for specifically Salah and Haaland, they are much, much better assets at home. Salah is excellent at Anfield. He went on that long spell of not blanking. And Haaland is significantly better as an asset at the Etihad. So immediately that really puts me off that they are both away. The other reason that I'm a little bit less keen on game week 37 is simply because the league could be wrapped up. Liverpool could win it. City could win it. Arsenal might have won it by this stage. There is a very good chance that going into either the first game of 37 or even the second, that the league is wrapped up and therefore they don't really need to risk their key players. They might want to play some other players from the bench, especially if they are in um, obviously the European Cup finals, which will be after game week 37. So I, I'm, I'm less keen on it for that reason. And then the final thing being that in game week 37, you are very, very likely to potentially want to play another chip, right? It's this big double game week. Lots of us might be struggling to field a good team if we've wildcarded a lot earlier. So we might want to use a free hit. And even if you've already used your free hit, if you don't see a potential opportunity coming up for the bench boost, you may well have saved your bench boost for this remaining double game week as well. So again, in comparison to 28 or even for some of us 25, 37 looks like a really good double game week to use other chips such as the bench boost and free here. So maybe I'm being a little bit biased here because my current strategy is game week 25 triple captain on Haaland, as you'll probably guess, but I just think it suits me. I'm captaining, triple captaining one of the best two assets in the game in Salah or Haaland. It's two home fixtures. City are firing at the moment. De Bruyne is back who feeds Haaland incredibly well. I can't really play any other chips in this game week other than the triple captaincy. 28, I just don't quite like because I don't fully trust Bournemouth and Solanke enough to play the chip. And in 37, I think I'm going to want to free hit or bench boost. And I'm just worried about them both being away. And obviously either team could have the league wrapped up at that stage. So for me, it's going to be game week 25. I do think it is the best week. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. The only time where I'm like, maybe you don't play it in 25 is if your team is looking at a position right now where you could potentially bench boost. So with that in mind, let's now move ahead to the next section, which is discussing, is this a potential week to play the bench boost? So as I said, one of the only reasons that I wouldn't look to triple captain this week, other than maybe if you just don't fancy playing the chip on Haaland, which is absolutely fair enough, is that your team is in a position to bench boost because I do really like it this game week. On your screen, you can see five things that I'm thinking about when I'm deciding, should I be bench boosting this week and just in general? I've got what, in my opinion, is a good points scoring for a bench boost chip, just that you've got a bit of an idea about what you're aiming for. And then I've got an example bench, which we'll discuss because I've seen some questions over on Twitter and this is maybe roughly what your bench is looking like if you're tempted by the chip. Obviously, I can't give every single person's bench. You can tune into the deadline stream and ask me that question specifically. But before we even move on to that, I do really like the bench boost in 25. I think especially if you've already wildcarded or if you're wildcarding very soon, it's nice because in my opinion, I like wildcarding directly before a bench boost often because it allows you to set up with the best possible bench boost, especially in a double game week. But we now know game week 34 is not going to be a particularly big double. So the only remaining doubles that you've got is 28, which again is a pretty small double and it's directly before a blank. And then you've got 34, which doesn't look like it will be great for a bench boost. And then you've got 37. So yes, you could still bench boost in 37, but unless you're planning to wildcard in like 35 or 36, there's a very good chance that your bench boost won't even be looking particularly good then. You may not even have a fully functioning bench, especially if you're wildcarding soon. And if you've already wildcarded, the further it gets away from your wildcard, again, it becomes more and more difficult to field a good bench. So I kind of feel like if your team is looking even semi-decent this week for a bench boost, I would be very tempted to play the chip. But here are the things that I'm thinking about. The first thing is, it's not even a question. It's a reminder to myself, benches are so unpredictable. Do not Beat yourself up if your bench scores really poorly in a bench boost and don't set unreasonably high expectations. Lots of people this week maybe would have had like Palmer on the bench. And yes, Palmer looked good, but a 10-pointer, relatively decent. Maybe you bench Saliba or Gabriel against West Ham away. Are you expecting a 12-pointer? No, not particularly. Benches are so unpredictable. That's the annoying thing about FPL is sometimes our bench will look weak and score us 30 points. And sometimes it will look absolutely cracking and you'll get like 10 points from it. So remind yourself that, yes, you can try and anticipate when your bench might score points, but that isn't always the way that FPL works. But when we're moving on to deciding should you play the chip, can you guarantee 15 starts? Especially in double game weeks, the ones that are doubling, can you confirm they start twice? Because for me, if you can only confirm 13 starts, you could be in a position where two players in your starting 11 don't play. You would have needed two players from your bench, right, to come on anyway, and they would have auto subbed on if they don't play at all. So I suppose maybe not even necessarily 15 starts, but can you guarantee 
that all 15 of players will feature because if you would have needed your bench naturally anyway, it just completely ruins the bench boost chip, in my opinion, because you'll get your first sub most likely regardless because the player in your starting 11 didn't play. Hopefully that makes sense, but I really think when you're playing the bench boost chip, you need to know that all of your players are available. If you've got like a Trent or a Charlie Taylor in there and you're just not sure, for me, it's just not going to be worth it. The next thing that I'm asking myself is, is there some upside with my bench? I'm not saying you need to have like Trent Alexander-Arnold with a perfect fixture on the bench, even if he's fully fit, or like a Pedro Porro. Like it doesn't have to have like loads of upside, but having one or two players that have the potential to go big with a bit of goal threat or a bit of assist threat in defense or just a really good fixture on paper, I feel like you need that. I, I wouldn't want to look at my bench and it'd be very underwhelming with like two centre backs with no goal threat and attacker with like really, really poor underlying data. For me, that's not a bench boost that can score you 20 plus points. So I need to have some upside on that bench. The next thing is, when will you use the wild card? Because like I said, if you're planning to use the wild card in 33, you could maybe set up for a bench boost in 34. If you've already used the wild card, there's probably not going to be a much better opportunity to bench boost. Because like I said, the further you get away from when you've wild carded, the more issues that crop up with injury and rotation. So when you've wild carded, if you've already wild carded, or when you plan on wild carding, may impact when you decide to use the bench boost. And also the final thing is, how good do you think triple captain Haaland is? Because you may have a really solid bench this week, but if in your opinion, Haaland is comfortably the best triple captain, much better than a Solanke in 28, and much better than a potential triple captain in 37, then it may outweigh how good you think your bench is. So these are all some of the things that I would be thinking about. It's up to you, really, to come to that decision yourself. Around how many points do I think is a good bench boost? These are completely arbitrary numbers based on my personal understanding of, of the bench boost chip. I would say a poor bench boost is anything under 12. So 0 to 11 points, I'd be very, very gutted with that. I think 12 to 16, I would call average. And the reason I use 16 as a number, if you had four double game week players, which we often do on a, on a bench boost, probably going to be more difficult this year. And they each get two appearance points in each game. That would be four points for each player. And that would be 16 points. So just through appearance points alone, if you were to play it in a big double game week and you had doublers on your bench, you'd be able to get 16. So I kind of think 12 to 16 is an average bench boost. I would say anything above 16 is really good you get into that stage. So 17 to 24, I would say, is a good bench boost. And I think 25 points plus is great. I think last season, no, not last season, the season before that, I had Ben Foster on my bench who saved a penalty, I think it was. And I came away with like 34 or 35 points. That was delightful. That was the very best bench boost I've ever had. So the best bench boost, I think it was actually 36. So, and that was absolutely ridiculous. But I did plan for it for a while. And if you remember, if you watched my videos, I think I took a minus eight for that. So really it wasn't 36, it was actually 28 points. And I guess that's a really important point here. If you're having to take loads of hits for your bench boost, you really need it to go well because those hits count. Obviously you can't say I scored 18 points if you took a minus 12 to get there. So if this was your bench roughly, you're looking at a keeper like the Bravkar or maybe Ariola. You're sat there with Palmer first sub as a lot of us have. Maybe you've got like a Saliba or a Gabriel on the bench. And maybe you even have someone like a Pinnock or a Regulon or even like a Doughty on the bench. Or let's replace Pinnock with, I don't know, Pedro Porro. Is that a bench boost worth doing? And what I sometimes do is I just go through this and I think, what is kind of a conservative way of looking at this bench? I think conservatively, the Bravka will probably concede against Bournemouth. I think a lot of people that have Solanke probably be thinking the same, but maybe you'll make a save point and maybe you'll only concede the one goal. And I think that is a pretty reasonable prediction. So let, let's say the Bravka comes away with three points. Of course, he can keep clean sheet, but let's go conservative here. Palmer, I, I think it is conservative to say that he'll blank or pick up maybe a single assist or something like that. Yes, he could score, but if we expect City to score lots of goals, he's probably not picking up that many bonus points. So I'm going to say two points for Palmer here, but that could be anywhere from two to ten. It could even be more than that. But let's say two. Pinnock, sadly, I don't think he's keeping a clean sheet in either game here. And again, a header is possible, absolutely, but is it likely... Absolutely not. And is it likely that he concedes two to four goals in both of these games? Again, probable. So I think you are looking at, at the very most, four points from Pinnock unless he gets an attacking return. But most likely what you're looking at, I would genuinely say is probably two points. Right? So it's three, two, two right, which puts us on seven. Saliba, I would say cons conservatively six. I think that's a very reasonable return. Burnley are not attacking overly well. We know how good Arsenal are, especially away from home. He could even pick up bonus points, but let's say six. That would put you on a 13-point bench boost, and that is quite conservative. If you chuck in the possible possibility for a Dubravka clean sheet and the possibility for a Palmer return, I would say you're probably looking at between 12 and 18 points for a bench boost like this. 
it could be 40 points. It could also be six points. Like if Dubravka concedes quite a few, Palmer gets a yellow card, Pinnock concedes four goals in either game and Saliba concedes, then it could be even worse. But I think realistically, if you're trying to predict how this is going, that 12 to 18, and in which case it is an okay bench boost. And I would be very, very tempted to just roll the dice because as I said, I'm not sure that you'll get a much, much better opportunity in the future without having to take hits or without interfering with a potential free hit in the future as well. So... If your bench is something like this, this would be right on the line. If your bench is better than this, if you're benching a player with a better fixture than Palmer, or you've got like a Flecken on the bench instead of the Bravka, then I think you're starting to get much closer to where I would be willing to bench boost. If you want me to answer your specific bench boost question, I'll try to reply to as many down below in the comments. So drop your bench down below and tell me if you're tempted or not. There are, of course, lots of questions around Liverpool assets, and I know we discussed them last week as well, but I want to give my updated opinion on whether I think you should be bringing them in, and if so, who, taking them out, Game Week 26, and all of that lovely stuff. So here are a few questions on your screen, and I'll just go through and answer them individually, and hopefully this helps you come to your own decisions as well. The first is, is it worth bringing in Jota or Darwin just for one week and then taking them out again? So lots of people in the position where they've got, I don't know, like a Watkins or a Solanke, and they're like, do I go to Darwin and then go straight back to that player again? Or maybe you've got, I don't know, like a, a Cole Palmer and you're wondering, should you do Cole Palmer to Jota in 25? I would say there are a few things that would impact the way that I feel about this. The first is, who are you taking out? And again, I've just given two very different examples there. If you're taking out Solanke or Watkins for Darwin, you are going to want to bring in Solanke or Watkins straight back in for Darwin in 26. So you are literally removing a player to then bring them back in immediately the game week after. In that position, I'm significantly less keen on it because not only is it two transfers to bring in Darwin and remove Darwin, but you're also going back to the play that you already had. My other concern specifically in that situation is you've probably got money tied up at least in Watkins and maybe even Solanke. So it's not just bringing in Darwin and then selling Darwin. If you sell Watkins to then bring Watkins back again, you're probably going to lose some money as well. So not only are you wondering, is it worth two transfers, but you're also worth wondering, is it worth two transfers and losing money as well? And you have to make sure you've got money in the bank to go back and that you don't get priced out of it. So in that situation, no, for me, it is not worth doing. When it comes to discussing something like, would you do Palmer to Jota just for 25 when you know you need to remove Jota for 26 anyway? I'm slightly more keen on that because you would have probably had to remove Palmer anyway in 26 or at least another one of your blankers. So I almost feel like it's not the same number of transfers or at least not the same route of having to remove a player that you want to bring straight back in anyway. You probably would have removed Palmer for someone else in 26 anyway. So it's just almost for me, I don't know if this is actually the mathematically correct way to think about it, but it's only the one extra transfer to do Palmer to Jota, but then you would have to remove that blanker anyway for 26. So I suppose if it's a player that's blanking in 26 anyway, and a player that you don't really want to bring back in, I'm slightly more keen on doing it in that situation. So yes, I do still think it's worth bringing in Jota or Darwin just for one week. I think they could go very, very big in this double, but I wouldn't be very keen on taking out a player that you want to bring directly straight back in, especially if you've got money tied up in them. The next question is, should we prioritize bringing in Liverpool assets this game week considering blank game week 26 for good assets with fixtures in both weeks? This is a similar question to the first one, but kind of reinforces the fact that no, I'm not entirely sure I would because if you view it this way, across the next two game weeks, Darwin plays Brentford away and Luton at home. I know it's all concentrated in game week 25, but he only has two fixtures across the next two weeks. If you're taking out a player that has, again, good fixtures across the next two, I'll use an example here because I need to make sure that I don't do this and don't be silly. Saka is a player that if you want De Bruyne or Salah, you could potentially sell to afford it because he is quite expensive. He's got Burnley and Newcastle. They are two of the best fixtures you can possibly have at the moment across the next two. So no, in that situation, Saka to Jota doesn't make sense for me. And I know you could say, well, you just bring him back in 26, but then you go into the same issue that I've just discussed. You're losing value on that player most likely. And it's also then two transfers rather than just keeping the player, especially if it's a player again that you could just keep through. So I really love attacking doubles and specifically this double for Liverpool does look like it has really high upside, but I'm not keen on removing players with two good fixtures and players that you're happy holding through as, as well. Again, given the fact that if you use Saka and his, and his example, he's got Brentford and Sheffield United directly after blank 26 as well. So I really, really like the idea of holding on to good quality assets and not shipping them out just because some teams have doubles. There are also questions around Salah, obviously. If you haven't yet seen, Salah was pictured back in full team training. Now, I will make this entirely 
clear. We don't yet know how much of the full team training he was involved in. I actually saw a thread over on Twitter. I can't remember who tweeted it and now I can't seem to find it but they basically went through the training ground footage which is always posted on YouTube from Liverpool every single week pretty much and Salah was involved in some of the training at the start of the day but when it got to the more intense stuff which is basically defense versus attack Salah wasn't actually involved in that so yes Salah was involved in team training at the start of the day but based on the footage that we have which is pretty comprehensive over on their YouTube channel it doesn't appear that Salah was involved in all of team training. So just because Salah is seen back kicking a football this week does not mean for a second that he's fit enough to start against Brentford or even get significant minutes against Luton. So I will just say with a pinch of salt we think Salah could be back for this double but I would be extremely shocked to see him get more than 90 minutes. I think what you're looking at as a best case scenario if you wanted Salah is a bench performance against Brentford and then maybe a start and 60 to 70 against Luton. But what is more likely, I think, is a rest against Brentford, a sub appearance against Luton and then ready probably for the cup final to play 60 to 70. I'm not obviously a medical expert, though I don't work at Liverpool, so I don't know that. But to answer your question, does Salah being back make the Liverpool attackers an avoid? I don't think so, but it certainly reduces their minutes if you think Salah gets significant minutes. I would say that two of Darwin, Jota or Diaz play both, start, start both in the double. I can't see a world in which two of those three don't start both. Because let's say that Salah doesn't start against Brentford, but he starts against Luton. You still need to play two of them alongside Salah. So I think Darwin and probably one of Jota and Diaz is going to start both in the double. It could, of course, be Darwin that's benched in one of them, or it could be that all three start both. But yes, it probably does slightly reduce their minutes. Does it make them avoid and avoid? Absolutely not. Especially players like Darwin and Jota. They are incredible off the bench. So if you get Brentford away for 80 to 90 minutes and then 30 minutes against Luton at home, that's still better than most single game players. So I would still be willing to go pretty much all in on Liverpool, assuming again the stuff we've already discussed that you're not removing really good assets with money tied up that you're going to want straight back in. So I'm not too worried about Salah. Am I going to bring Salah in? Again, Liverpool are actually the early kickoff in game week 25. So we should know if Salah starts. And if he does start against Brentford somehow, that will make it very, very interesting. But I still think my team's just set up in a position. I would have to break my team and sell Saka and take a hit to bring Salah in on the off chance that he gets enough minutes across the double to make it worth it to then remove him once again. Especially when you look at their fixtures overall, Liverpool. I'm just less keen on it. So I actually think even if Salah is confirmed to start against Brentford away, I probably wouldn't do it, maybe to my own detriment. Hopefully I've discussed everything or cried there because we've discussed Liverpool defenders in the first section. We've discussed Salah bringing in the likes of Jota and Darwin. I suppose the only other final thing is around Diaz. Is Diaz a better option or equivalent of Jota and Darwin? I still don't think he's quite as good of an option. He's just not quite as much of a goal threat as Jota and Darwin. And I think therefore his ceiling is probably slightly lower. So if you if you can't afford Jota or Darwin or you just want to go for a differential, I really don't mind him. And I don't think he'll get too many fewer minutes than the likes of Jota and Darwin. But for me, I think Jota and Darwin are slightly more nailed and I think they're slightly better FPL assets. But I do really like Diaz. Hopefully I've managed to answer all of your questions around Liverpool. But if there are any that I've missed, let me know down below in the comments. So a few other questions that I wanted to briefly answer because I spent far too long talking about a very few topics in this video. The first question being, do you prefer Tony over Darwin if we just need to remove Darwin in 26 anyway? I actually do quite like this because Tony, you would probably expect to get chances to return at least once in this double coming up. And if he does return once, you need Darwin to re probably return at least twice to make it worth going with Darwin, considering you then have to remove him in 26, as you say. And again, Tony then plays in game week 29 as well against Burnley. So what you get with Tony is a fixture and a good fixture in both of the blanks. My only slight concern is outside of that, the fixtures aren't great. And even in the double this week, whilst I do expect him to get their chances to return, they're, they're nowhere, the fixtures are nowhere near as good as those for Darwin. So I certainly think it is a, a lower ceiling this week. But longer term, if you're looking at your team, you're thinking it's a disaster for 26. It's potentially a disaster for 29. I don't have a free hit. Then yes, definitely. And again, if, especially if you don't have a free hit available, you've already used it. I think bringing in Tony could be really nice. The next question was, are Luton assets still good? Are they still worth bringing in now? My answer to this is, to the first question, they're okay. Yeah, probably not worth bringing in this week for me. I don't expect much in either of the upcoming fixtures. Manchester United, I know, haven't been great this season, but they've improved a lot recently, and Liverpool is not a good fixture. 
So I look at that double and I don't see much. They blank in 26. And yes, they have a double in 28. But we don't know for a fact they'll even play in 29. And you can just bring them in for that double in 28 as well. So I kind of feel like because you didn't bring them in last week for Sheffield United. And I know they didn't even do particularly well. But that was the fixture to bring them in for. Now I think I would just wait until game at 28 personally. The next question is, is KDB still worth moving for now? Or is he too much of a risk? I'm recording this after the Champions League game. I wanted to wait just in case there was any big news that came out or any players got injured that were obviously like the likes of KDB, Foden and Haaland. But KDB got a goal and an assist, played 90 minutes once again. Absolutely exceptional once again. Yes, still go for KDB. Is he a risk? Absolutely. Will he definitely start the next three Premier League games? I don't know. But we know that he can return off the bench. And I feel like he is starting to get close to what we've seen from him in the past. He's not just playing, he's playing well. And Haaland looks a little bit fitter as well. And I just think a firing KDB, Haaland and Foden all playing together could be an absolutely monstrous score. So yes, I would still I would still absolutely be worth moving for KDB, but I don't know if it's worth breaking your team to bring him in. But I do really like him as an option. Would you start your Brentford and Luton defenders ahead of an Arsenal defender or Porro? No, I actually wouldn't, I don't think. The only, the only slight consideration I would have is maybe someone like a Regulon because he's got the attacking data as well. Maybe someone like a Doughty because again, they've got the attacking data. But if you were to say, predict how many clean sheets Brentford and Luton will get, none. And whilst attacking returns are possible, they're never likely for a player, especially in a difficult fixture. So you could be genuinely looking at two or three points for your Luton and Brentford defenders. Whereas when we look at someone like Saliba or Gabriel, like I said, clean sheet is very likely. So I think I would prefer to play your Arsenal defender this week. Maybe Barr, Doughty, and maybe Regulon. But outside of that, yeah, I would just play your, your Arsenal defenders. Maybe not Porro. Maybe I would have your doublers ahead of Porro simply because obviously... Poro's data has not been great recently and Spurs don't keep that many clean sheets. The final question, is it essential to have Triple City and Triple Liverpool for game week 25? The short answer to this is absolutely not. Especially Triple Liverpool because they blank in 26. And because we don't have Salah fully fit, we don't believe yet. And because Trent is now flagged as well, one of Darwin or Jota is fine. And then if you don't feel the need to go for a defender, I think you could comfortably go into it with just one Liverpool. And that could potentially be fine. City are a lot better to own because they obviously play in blank game at 26 as well. But most of us have Haaland. A lot of us have one off Foden and De Bruyne. I think that would probably serve you fine as well. So whilst I absolutely love going big on the doubles, if you told me you were only going to, into this with one Liverpool attacker and then Foden and Haaland, I wouldn't go, that's an absolutely terrible idea. I'd go, do you know what? Fair enough. That seems relatively reasonable. So no, it is absolutely not critical to have Triple City and Triple Liverpool for the double. Hopefully I've answered as many of your questions as possible in this video. Let me know down below if there are any that I've not answered and I'll try to cover them instead in the deadline decisions video on Friday. So guys, there you have it. That is a very long video once again on Double Game 25, spending probably at least half the video discussing defenders at the start. But I think for a lot of us, that might be a key decision this week. If you did enjoy today's video and you got any use out of it, please do smash that like button. And if you've somehow not yet subscribed, but you've still watched to this point, please do consider subscribing. Until next time, thank you very much for watching. Cheers. Bye-bye.